Welcome to another episode of Money You Should Ask. I'm your host, Bob Wheeler. And in this episode, we're going to explore, question, examine, converse, dig deep, expose, laugh, and cry about the money beliefs, money blocks, and life challenges of our next guest. Turn up the volume, listen, learn, and laugh. Well, I am excited (laughs) because this week's guest is the one and only Joanna Cassidy, an award-winning actress best known for her roles in Blade Runner, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and the HBO series Six Feet Under. Having envisioned a career in science and art, Joanna has embraced the twists of fate that have transformed her life. Her long list of accomplishments, her long list of accomplishments include winning a Golden Globe, being nominated for three Emmys, a Saturn Award, two Actors Guild Awards, two Canadian Screen Awards, which is the equivalent of an Emmy, and a Geordie Award. Um, a ton of ton of them. She's got a closet full that she keeps hidden with a light. Um, <laughs> this is her second time here on Money You Should Ask, and it's so wonderful to catch up and see you again. Joanna, welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you again, too, Bob. Yeah. So, gosh, the last time we spoke, it was pre-COVID. That's right. And uh, the world has changed a little bit. What, was my hair blonde and long <laughs> then? I don't even remember. I, I mean, that was a couple of years ago. It was sort of, you know— and, and anything pre-COVID is not going to be anything like it, what, what it is right now, because no. it, that was a different world. It was a different world. Yeah, we've morphed now into this new state of being. That's right. I feel like we're actually moving into Blade Runner in a couple of years. Uh, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. In fact, I, I have a call into Sherry, um, uh, what's her name, Mrs. Mrs. York, and, and, and I think they should do a Blade Runner series. I think it would be amazing. Oh, I actually think it would. It mm-hmm. would. And I, I sometimes look out in LA and I think it's coming. <laughs> it is. It's it here. Is. I mean, you can it's, go da- downtown. Downtown is, it's, is absolutely Blade Runner. It's a little crazy. 2019, yes. It's a little crazy. Yep. So just to refresh people, um, and uh, you grew up in New Jersey. That's where your folks are from. Um, and then you moved to, uh, then you went to Syracuse. I did. Which is still on the East Coast. Then you ended up in San Francisco and then L.A. That's correct. That's a pretty indirect <laughs> way to get to L.A. <laughs> I, you know, in, in my thinking about this, as I've thought about it many times, in, in fact, even in <clears throat> attempting to do a memoir, I, and I, I, although my first marriage was, was not the best marriage, uh, I thought, well, perhaps if I hadn't married him, I wouldn't have ended up in San Francisco because he— was a medical student and accepted ah. an internship in San Francisco, Mount Zion Hospital. Okay. On to visit Arrow Street. I do remember the past <laughs> somewhat. And um, I don't think I would have gotten there. Wow. Which then you might not have gotten to LA. I might not have gotten here. You'd still be living with your parents in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not with them, but maybe in the maybe, town. Maybe in the town. Because actually a lot of the high school people uh, that I— experienced high school with are, if not there, in the surrounding area. In, with Yeah, within close 15 minutes. Close family close. ties, yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, we don't have close family ties in L.A. <laughs> no. Is like, there such a thing as family in L.A.? I don't think so. No, I don't even, I, <laughs> half the people don't even know their neighbors. You know, it's <laughs> like if you're talking to your neighbor, you're strange. It's uh, it's. I know mine. It's Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm nosy Joe. Oh, that's good. It's that's that, good. Uh, crazy actress in that. <laughs> Now, when you grew, up, so you grew up in New Jersey. Your father was Scotch, and um, my family drank lots of Scotch. But well, actually, we are Scotch. We're Scotch Irish. But uh, your family was very tight. If I is is that fair to say, tight? Mm-hmm. Daddy, Daddy was yes. <clears throat> how did you break that cycle? Like, how did you like you went off and did this whole creative thing? And even when you talked, we talked last week when you had a house and your parents saw the house and how freaked out. And how I'm like, oh my God, you wasted all this money, or you, you know, what have you done? How did you break? Like, how do you get out of that? It, it was a long road because when when I was married, and I think I may have told you this before, you know, a medical student going through internship and residency, they're so poor. We, I was literally buying chicken necks and cutting the meat <laughs> off the bones, it was, you know, to make a salad for us. We were really poor, and <clears throat> when I drove to Los Angeles with my children. Uh, I had no dreams of mansions or anything like that, but I, what I had was a kind of a, I had dreams and I had a, this image of this 
I didn't even want to be a movie star. It was right. it was just about the life that could be led. Right. And I learned that from watching films from a young girl. And I just thought, how, not even glamorous. I didn't, and, and even though it was glamorous, I thought, how glorious. Yeah. To, to live in a home where you, you know, and wear beautiful clothes. I always liked that. I was always a, my mother was a fashionista. Okay. And her small New Jersey way, and she'd kill me for saying that now, but she always, she was a beautiful woman and made her own clothes and such, which I did as well, starting out. You know, you just do things like that. And yeah. very sort of Vivian Westwood, you know, kind of look, a little hippie-ish and so on. One of the first investments that I made was in a property up in the Hollywood Hills, <clears throat> that was owned by a man named August. And I always, in my sort of spiritual way, I, I was born in August and I thought, August, August, you know, and it was on a hill up near the cross in Hollywood. And also the woman who owned the property at one time was Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even, it, it was a little house. Yeah. And it was so cheap. And I the, the little monies that I made from modeling, I thought, I'm going to buy that. It was all of $22,000. Wow. Well, that $22,000 purchase, because I had someone living on the property and he rented it from me, started to grow. And year by year, you know, not very much, it started to gain in value, and I liked that. During the time uh, that I was here early on, I was doing really sort of big movies. Mm -hmm. I did a movie called The Outfit with Robert Ryan and Karen Black and Robert Duvall. And um, so I was in that whole circle, and I dated men who were part of the film business and yeah. producers and so on. And I I just thought that life was so interesting, even though I never felt part of it. Right. Because I still had that New Jersey girl in me. I liked looking at it and I liked sort of weaving in and out of it. Yeah. And um, I, I'll i tie this together in a minute. But I was always sort of creative because even when I lived with my husband and children in San Francisco, I would take my daughter to... Uh, Houses that they were tearing down. And we would get bits and pieces from it, like the corbels from the houses. And we would make uh, uh, terrariums okay, out yeah. of them, you know, and, and gather things around it and build these sort of magical little places. So I wasn't concerned about getting that. Mm -hmm. I could experience it by looking at it, participating in it, and building it. So from that little purchase, um, I got involved in a, I don't know, I just started getting involved in things. And I think it was because I let my antenna just get out there yeah. and start finding interesting places to go to. Yeah. And then I got involved with a, a CPA who represented some very interesting people, Hervé Villachez and some other actors, and we started a company called Lips Chips. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did I tell you about Lips Chips? Yeah. I did. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love the first natural, yeah, natural <laughs> chips. the first natural chip. And we had our store on Pico Boulevard and had we not gone crazy, that, that would have been it. Yeah. There were wise potato chips wanted to buy us. Yeah. The group of us said, no. I said, big mistake. We should sell it to them. No, no, no. We'll hold. Anyway, needless to say, it sort of went away for a while. And then the next thing, you know, almost 20 years later, kettle chips. I mean, uh, anyway, all these little things I'm playing with, as well as um, uh, starting to make a little money in the business. and. Yeah. Whenever I made a little money, I, I would put it away. And then I would, my first home, uh, I bought in 1984. Okay. And that was in Brentwood. Um, it was a little home and it happened to be 
because the CPA had a real estate license as well oh, as okay. being a CPA. Oh, so, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, so he would say, so he did a little double dealing there. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, I got in the home and it was, it was fun. The excitement of owning my own little home was just beyond. So yeah. I started to build on that. And because I loved plants and flowers, this, and then I did a movie with Gower Champion. His wife was a designer. So I pulled her in and we started designing this house and making it into something really special. Anyway, I was there for a while and okay, all the while the market is climbing. And I mean, it had its dips and so on. Right, but, right, um, yeah. That's sort of what happened. I, I knew that uh, owning a piece of property because my parents had, that, that that was sort of key and you didn't, you know, I, yeah, the white picket fence, great, uh, but- Definitely a garage, three bedrooms, and two baths. Yeah, uh, you know that was that yeah. was it. And I thought, well, that makes sense. You use one bedroom for an office, <clears throat> the master bedroom, and a guest or children, and, and a guest bedroom. That that made sense. That's what I had, and I yeah. that was normal to me. Right. I mean, it was out of the box, the, the expense wise, but I thought well, I can do this. I'm young. I I have energy. And um, there were many uh, little garage sales along the way. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> that's how you kept things going. Anyway, one thing begot the other, beget the next and next and next. In the meantime, I'm making connections. And what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, yeah, just asking how you, you know, you got into buying that house and how you had the sense to huh? just like, oh, let me do this, let me do that. And it sounds like there was a lot of, positive influence from the CPA, from your parents owning property um, <clears throat> that kept you, because a lot of people would have just been like, oh, let me spend or let me do this. And you actually, even if it wasn't super well, conscious, true. you had some kind of sense of- This is a very solid upbringing in a small yeah. town in New Jersey. You had people who were very stable and yeah. that's what they did. Their their house was probably their house forever. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's that's how it was. The same set of bedroom furniture. I, that was not my ilk because I was already doing art with my furniture. And then I was meeting artists and I was right. selling art in between all this. So there were money flows. There were money yeah. avenues down which I, I, I could take. I just kept it moving. And then in, um, in 1982, I did Blade Runner. Right. And then, you know, all bets were off. I started working and making some really good money. And and I I had two children and I wanted to put them in a place that was solid. Yeah. Where we felt that we could come could come home to every night. I didn't want to be in an apartment. I had lived in apartments with my ex when he was in Washington, DC, uh doing preventive medicine and so I wanted a yard. I wanted an animal. Yeah. I had that, you know, version of what it should be to be a family. Yeah. And did you get the animal? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yes. Joe Cocker. Oh. <laughs> Joe Cocker. I'm guessing he was a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> and he sang too. Oh, there you go. Yeah. They, but they don't they don't tell you when you're getting the. I, I was reading about the the puppy closer sale. You know, when you get the puppy, they don't tell you you're going to be cleaning up poop forever. They're going to tear up the house. Oh, you know, uh, all those things. You but can't they don't tell the you that when you have a child either. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you might send them back, but that's the thing. You, the kids, you sort of you sort of have to keep them. Uh, yeah, you kind of have to keep them. Okay, so you had the house, you had the puppy, you had the kids. Um, what kind of car do you drive now? I mean, I mean, you probably had the car then, but what kind of car do you have now? And how did you decide to buy that kind of car? Um, I had a, um, <clears throat> when I drove down from San Francisco, uh, I had a Pinto. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I do, know Pinto. Do, do you remember mm -hmm, those? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have some sad stories about a Pinto, but yes. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was one time that I was, I remember when I was uh, driving around the valley and I had no idea, but I had left the back hood open, you know, yeah. the like the trunk sort of thing, because it didn't really have a trunk. It just right. had, right. Right. And everyone was going, and I thought, oh gosh, they recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> and 
clearly was not that at all. Uh, <laughs> so I had many adventures. Um, then I bought Mark Harmon's convertible Volkswagen. Oh, wow. Okay. So I had that for a while. I repainted it, put on a new roof, blah, blah, blah. I had that. I had a 54 DeSoto cool. that I bought in Arizona when I was there working on a job. Um, I have a Lexus now, which I love. The car of my dreams is, uh, I really want to get a Tesla. Okay. I, I, I love that car. I think the lines on the Tesla are beautiful. Yeah. And they're very comfortable. Yeah. Cars. And I, I mean, I was, you know, it, around 2015, the uh, model that they came out with them was, it has a really nice uh, area down low where you mm -hmm. put your purse and your shopping bags and all that. And I thought, that's the greatest thing ever. It's not up high. So you only yeah. have a little tiny space. You know, it's a, it's a really smart car. I don't know what that guy's smoking, but he's, he's smoking amazing. some good stuff. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> he's done well. Yeah. So, but, and what do you love about the Lexus that you're in now? I love Lexus. I'm in a Lexus. Um, oh, we should do a Lexus car, commercial. The car seats are amazing. They are. I, I get into a, I'm going to be a little bit of a snob now. BMW cars have the hardest seats I've ever sat on in my life. Yeah. I can't. Now, mind you, they stay really clean. I don't know whether they, at night they have a ghost and the ghost comes yeah. in and <laughs> vacuums them up, but they, they manage to stay so clean because I think the seats bounce all the dirt off them. Yeah. <laughs> I've never sat in such a hard car. Yeah. Anyway, the, the Lexus is gooshy. You sit down and you just, seem to glide. It's not an old Lexus, but it's it's an older model, but it's there's a little too much sound. So I think being in a quiet car that yeah. doesn't make any noise is magic. It's magic. Yeah. yeah. Now, I love Lexus. I picked Lexus because I asked a mechanic, what car never goes into the garage for service? And he said, the only car we never see in the garage, um, unless it's just annual maintenance, is a Lexus. Huh. And I've had like eight of them. <laughs> Real, is that so? Yeah, it's I. It's I love them, um, and they are so comfortable. Now, do you have the new one with the fish grill, the big grill? No, I, mine's like two years old, and I'm see. I'm not one that looks at cars and goes, "Wow, that's a pretty line." I'm like, "Oh my is Bob, it <laughs> <laughs> oh Bob." I'm going, oh, I can't stand that grill. I can't stand it. I've got, I've got to go back to an older uh, Lexus again. Totally oh practical. It's total practical. Oh, I and can't believe it. I can't <laughs> believe it. I'm all about style. It's, it's got, And that grill just drives me crazy. But now I think I'm, I'm getting used to it. Yeah. So I'm sure you have the grill. <laughs> I probably do. You have it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't pay attention. I, yeah, I know. Believe okay. me. That's if, all right. It's, 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 it's sad. Um, what, so, okay. So you're currently driving a Lexus. What is the current book that you're reading? What are you reading right now? Well, right now I, I brought this book in because I, I love this book. It's uh, Who Stole My Pension by Robert Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki. Yes. Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki. Yes. Rich Dad, Poor Dad Guy. Yep. Um, brilliant, brilliant book. I mean, he just tells it like it is. I think, um, with the, the way the market is going right now, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, you know, everything was going along. Yeah. And then about mid-COVID, as you know, things started getting really nuts with the stock market. Oh, yeah. Veteran and all this Bitcoin and all this stuff. And we still don't know whether that's real. Right. <clears throat> I'd like to know, but I'm not jumping on that bandwagon yet. Yeah. Maybe I yep. should have, but when it was... 6,000, now it's 68 or whatever it is. It's, I know. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Is there, they say that it's backed, that it's insured. Right. Is it? Yeah. Who? Do we know? We don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know. I, I mean, that's scary to me. Yeah. The stock market is scary to me. He talks all about it. So it's more of a just informational, not a workbook on how to it's create your own pension. Too. Oh, okay, cool. It is a work. <laughs> okay, listen to this. I just opened this up to this page. It says, Rich Dad, savers become losers. Oh, <laughs> okay. 
Interesting. Wow. He says in this book that you don't have to work to get rich. You don't have to work. Right. I found that quite extraordinary. He also, one of the other points that he makes in this book, which I haven't read it for a while. I've, I think I read it pre-COVID. He says that one of the biggest mistakes that people make is not talking to their children about money. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with that. That's one thing that uh, I have to say that my my daughter got hard and clear from me because I was brought up with uh, parents that never talked about money. It was right. verboten. You, you just didn't do that. It was against the rules and nobody knew anything. So we're like, mm, you know. And in fact, uh, both my sister and I had this, we're kind of told that, in order to have that, you get married. Right. Then you, uh, your husband works, you stay home and right. raise the children. Find a good man. Yeah, find a good man. And I, that never sat with me. <laughs> I think it didn't sit with a lot of women. <laughs> uh, just didn't quite cut it. And uh, uh, after my uh, divorce, I, I made it very clear uh, about money and, yeah. and uh, the, the joy of it and the difficulty of it. Right, because they're both. It can be both, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do think that a lot of people, you know, our <clears throat> my family did not talk about money. Um, and I knew that my parents didn't handle money well um, because my grandparents helped cover us for, like they made the down payments on all the houses that we um, lived in. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we just weren't taught. And so it wasn't like that they intentionally did it. They just had no clue. Right. They just had no clue. And if they had money, then, you know, oh, look, I'm successful. But it had nothing to do with consciousness. (laughs) It it was a very limited thinking. It was a real, in fact, it was a real lowdown thinking. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you know a lot of the history of the Scots-Irish. That was was almost— chipped into them. It was their yeah. DNA. You, yeah. you came to the States, you were uh, sort of indentured slavery in yeah. a way. I mean, the Irish uh, were often yeah. treated like uh, slaves. Yeah, and you have and to work can, hard. It has to be painful. You, no painful. No enjoyment, no I mean, pleasure. I mean, how do you like those words, wrapping around money? <laughs> painful, joyless. <laughs> you know, that's not the way to think of it. It's an exchange. My parents didn't understand that about me. I saw money coming in and I saw it going out. It, yeah. It's circular. Yeah. What goes out, you're giving. Right. They didn't see it that way. That's right. spending. That's uh, that's a terrible thing. That's who you can't do that. You're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm actually in a situation right now as are uh, a lot of the actors in Screen Actors Guild um and I've been in the film business for a long, long, long time, decades. And uh, I've been putting money into pension and health all these years. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Screen Actors Guild president and her minions uh, just, and the um, pension people who are sort of, they're like the semi-gods in the- <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> in this organization union have just taken uh, anyone over 65 off the health care. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not very nice because they have a really good health insurance plan. Like they have a great <laughs> insurance plan. And uh, so right now, because I'm, I'm still on it because I'm still earning and, uh, but my earnings have, it works in quarters. You have yeah, to yeah. make so much in a quarter. And if right. you don't, then you're... Uh, so I'm coming up to being off it. And so I'm juggling around different venues to figure out where I'm going to go. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm both on the uh, national board and the local board of the union. I have been for 20 years with awesome. Francis Fisher and Elliot Gould and several other uh, big names. Um and we are part of a, a the union called Membership First. First of all, we want to get the president out and we want to get our people in and get back our health plan. Yeah. 
There was no reason for this to happen. So in other words, a 30-year-old is now enjoying the labors of my, you know, the fruits of my labors. And uh, that's just not fair. So those are the parts of money stuff that really upsets me. That's the only thing. Otherwise, I can... I can go with the flow. I I I understand how the world works, mm-hmm. but um, if anyone wants to find out about this, you just go to the membership first website and uh, go on the health plan, healthplan.org, and you can look into this. Because I mean, at some point, everyone has to face this. Well, they do, and especially actors, people in the creative world don't have a lot of safety nets. I mean, some right. may have been fortunate uh, <clears throat> to have made the big money, but a lot yeah. of those character actors and the staple actors, like, they don't have that extra money, um, and they need that health insurance. That's correct. They need and those it's benefits. It's all kind of an illusion. You get you get in there, and you just go, oh, I'm Okay managers, you're okay, you're okay, yeah. you're, you're fine, you're covered, you know, plan covers this, covers that. And you sort of go along, but you don't know, and this is, people have to become very aware of this. Because, yes, the actors have no safety net. You can be working at one point and then not work for years. It could be years. Yeah, I've had several clients who had a hit show, making a million dollars a year, yep. five years in a row. They go out and buy that mansion. The show doesn't get picked up. Yep. And now they're living in a two-bedroom apartment in Studio City, Oof. and which is nice. But it's okay. But when you go from the pool and the mansion, right. um, but you know, I, I've some of you know some of my clients. I tell them, don't <clears throat> live off the million or the two million. Like that's what you live on. Live go back sensibly. to live what you were living on before you got the million. That's right. And those clients have done much better um, because they're not. You know, I have <laughs> one client. You know, the first year they made all this money. I'm like. You've got $3 million of money you didn't tell me about. And they're like, oh, I forgot about that because I just don't want to remember it so that I live off my budget. And I'm like, well, you're going to owe a lot of taxes on that $3 million we didn't know about. And for the next 10 years, extra $3 million, extra $4 million. Mm-hmm. But he <clears throat> always lived on, I make $100,000 a year. Is that so? Mm-hmm. Huh. And you manage him? <laughs> <laughs> I do his taxes. I do his taxes. <laughs> he did that on his own, but it was. But that's the like very conscious the mentality. Because he said, "Look, I'm an act. I'm an. I'm a creative sort. It's not guaranteed. My future is not guaranteed. His is guaranteed. Let me tell you, <laughs> it's guaranteed. Sounds like it is. But but he didn't go overboard. You know, when he mm-hmm. finally did, he was like, "All right, I'm going to buy this sixty thousand dollar car. I'm like, you've earned it." <laughs> That's okay. Go spend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but I think a lot of people they don't they they don't pay attention or they you know well they don't want to pay attention yeah. because it's very hard to look at the reality of things. I I mean I often don't want to do that. Yeah. And so I but I I'm not like people who take a credit card and go out and spend put 25,000 on it or something. I never Ugh. do that. Yeah. Never do that. I'm very careful about that. So, and I have a, an older car. I'm, I, 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 I want that car, but I'm not going to get it yet. Yeah, I get it when I can. And, and where did you learn that delayed gratification? <laughs> like, was that just something over time, or is that from the Scotch influence? Well, a bit of both. A bit of both. He he raps me on the head from up there, <laughs> and he goes, "Don't don't do that, Joe." Yeah. Don't spend it. Don't spend it. But it, it's it's got to come and go, right? Otherwise, it doesn't flow back to us. Yeah. That's like, I used to try to be, I was so tight with the book. And then I realized I have all these clients and all these great skills and they're paying me to help them. Let me, let me do an exchange back. So right. I really started, oh, hey, can you do this for me? This client does my upholstery. This client does. And I really wanted to like, Make it circular instead mm-hmm. of me just trying to hold every dollar that everybody else is bringing through. Right. That's, I think that's very, bar, bartering, yeah. I mean, is, is, is clever. And it's good. a good, it's a good thing. What mm-hmm. are your worries now? What financial worries do you have? Um, you've done all these different things. You've got life experience, but is there anything that's still like? <gasps> yes. 
I, I bought into, uh, as I was sitting idly at home during COVID <laughs> and I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm bored. Maybe I should learn more about stocks because I, I had my stock with someone. And, um, and I started, I thought I can do this. And I got into things like I'd buy these, like the Motley Fool and right, 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 things right. like that. Yep, and I, yep. I, and then but once you, you get in there and then you can't get that until you get into this. Right. So then you have to pay for that. And then it's, well, but if you pay this, then you have the, you know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't go that far because that's, I mean, that's like psychic craziness to me. Yeah. The thing that bothers me about the world right now and about is, as I mentioned before, all this, um, I I think we don't know where we are right now, but, yeah. but the money thing, we don't know which way we're going to go with that. Mm-hmm. So it scares me when I read or read about, well, blah, 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 bought um, the 100,000 Bitcoins or what, you know, and now they're, they're, uh, I don't know what you call them, Gen X or millen- not millennials, but I, the young the, ones. The, the, young, the young ones are now, they're all going to be millionaires and pretty soon a millionaire is going to be nothing. Right. You have to be a billionaire. And yeah. I'm going, oh my God, I can't, I can't keep up with this. Yeah. That puts me in terrible turmoil. Yeah. I don't like that. That scares me. Yeah. Because when it's going so fast, I it's, to me, I I like to take my time with things, yeah. and I, I I like to sit down at a table. I can't sit at a computer and bang all this stuff out. I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not. Com- I, I'm somewhat computer savvy, but I'm not yeah. brilliant at it. Like some people just go on and do like that, and I I just to me that's all in the air. Yeah, that j- it just doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't know where to go with that. Yeah. So, no, I think that's hard. I mean, even it, it's interesting. Um, my business partner and I were talking about even in accounting, a lot of the younger accounts coming up, they just do everything on the computer. So they don't actually know how to do a check and a balance. They don't know how to audit. They don't know how to do certain things because they're just used to pushing a button. And there's so much that's being lost with all this speed yes. and technology, we're actually losing a lot of foundational stuff. I, I believe so. And I see it shooting up onto a level that's becoming so kind of ethereal that there's not going to be any groundwork. It's sort yeah. of like the city of New York is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger, bigger buildings. And I, I see it collapsing one day. Yeah. The infrastructure is not there. It's not there. It's gone away. And, and, and where I, do we sit on the people that used to, you know, CPAs that used to sit and write everything out? And, and track it. Yeah. And track it. My dad was like that. He had papers and books and ledgers that everything was written out. I like that. That yeah. gave me a, a sense of security and finality because we knew where everything was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It just, it is moving fast. So, you know, in, 50 years, I won't have to worry about it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, maybe they'll invent a pill that That's you, know, right. you just pop a pill and you'll be around till you're For 200. A couple hundred years. That won't be so bad. As long as I can, as long as I don't have to have somebody change my diapers or brush my teeth. I'd like to be able to do those two things <laughs> yes. on my own. That's... <laughs> that's that's where I draw the line. They can dress me, but I'd I'd like to be able to. There you go. Not have to change a diaper. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, we're at we're at fast five. So I'm going to ask you. I have to ask you these. I don't have to ask you these, but I'm going to ask you these. Okay. So we're just going to have a little fun here. Um, if you came, um, if you came with a warning label, um, uh, what would yours say? Dangerous Cassidy. <laughs> Keep um, your hands off. Keep your hands off. <laughs> <laughs> what what indulgent what indulgence would you never give up? Chocolate. Uh, I have some chocolate for you. So, uh, what's your weapon of choice? My mind. <laughs> <laughs> what's the strangest gift you ever received? A dinner from Chasen's that was sent from Beverly Hills to Louisiana. <laughs> and it, it arrived late. <laughs> That's a little strange. That was very strange. 
and not even requested. Just not even requested, but creative. Creative. But, uh, creative, but three days later, the meal was a little flat. Yeah, I I can imagine. <laughs> I I mailed yeah I mailed a salmon once through the mail and uh, it got lost in the mail oh, and dear. the dry ice and uh, I had to throw the salmon out yeah yeah it bad so <laughs> if you if you found five thousand on the ground uh, what would you do with it I'd pick it up for sure mm-hmm. um, I I'd look around I think I'd look to see if it was in a package I'd look to see if it belonged to anyone. Um, I, I would find out if it belonged to anybody. And if it didn't, I'd put it in my pocket. <laughs> hey, the universe was giving it to you. That's right. That's The universe said it didn't need to be over here. It needs to be right it here. It needs to be with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. So, sweet spot, eminent moment, our um, wealth and wisdom. Piece of advice, financial tip, something you've learned along the way that our listeners can, you know, just... Something that can help them that's practical or just an insight? I I think it's really important now that we've seen what can happen with uh, food. We've seen the Suez Canal being stopped up. Uh, We need to, uh, I think we need to go back to the earth more. Mm -hmm. I think if you have a piece of land or a spot, uh, I I used to live next to this um, Indian family and... B.B. was his name. He made dinner for them every day, and he had a little strip of land that was, I would say, was no more than five feet by 15 feet. Yeah. He grew everything there. Wow. And it was dry, and he never watered it with a hose because they didn't want to spend the money. But he took a watering can and watered it. He provided meals for them all the six months out of the year with his vegetables and plants. I think that's essential. We have to go back. Land is crucial, real estate in some form. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a great, um, I think it's called Kiss the Soil um, documentary that's out right now. There's just the the importance of getting back to that stuff, I think. Yeah. And you can grow your own vegetables. Um, even in LA, you can have your own um, honeybees. I've, I've got my, I haven't put the bees in it yet, but I have two hives. Um and I'm, I have a guy for you. Okay. All right. I'm going to get my bees going and uh, growing your own food. I grow all my, um, you know, herbs. basil and mm-hmm. herbs. Yeah. Um, and I try to then eat them so they don't just grow, <laughs> bloom and die. <laughs> trying to work on that. But Good. <laughs> we're Good. working on it. But yeah, that's... So, you know, the, I mean, here's the... The thing that I notice about you is you're always upbeat. You always are positive And maybe like you're killing people behind the scenes. But my experience is that like, how do you stay so positive and how do you, I know you go with the flow um, and that's sort of a mantra of yours. Um, But like, how do you stay positive with all the craziness that's going on in the world, all these different things going on financially, things are changing. Uh, We're in this totally new world uh, post COVID as we come out of it. How do you stay engaged, present, and positive. Well, I think it's. I went to a, a seminar many, many, many years, uh, and I learned something there, <clears throat> which is, if you act enthusiastic, you'll be enthusiastic. Mm. And enthusiasm, and oh, the other thing is uh, movement. I keep myself fluid by. Uh, exercise and uh, stretching and all that. And I really believe that physiologically that keeps your brain up Yeah. Uh, despite anything. There are times when I bottom out, of course, I, I get scared. Mm-hmm. But whatever that fear is, I can take that fear and turn it around by dancing, putting on some good music. It's kind of simple. Laying yeah. in the grass, looking at the sky, you know, all this other stuff is BS. Yeah. It's all BS. It's all fake. I, I will say one thing that there, you know, there is some fake news out there. Yeah. And it's news that we receive in many different areas. It's people's attitude. It's 
you know, how they view things. I don't want to view it like that. Yeah. And I, I am my own way of seeing things. But I'm also, as I get older, I'm also more of a realist than I can actually define what I call um, bullshit. <laughs> Basically, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, really. And uh, every now and again, I'll get caught up on the train of, you know, the flying away with our, you know, money and all that sort of thing. But I'm not going to do that. I've had a really good life. Yeah. A good life. So I, I have those memories. Yeah. And I can bring forth those memories of, of, you know, how it was and how I've gotten here. I'm still here. Yeah. And I'm still traveling along. So I know that when I get caught up, I'm still going to go on. There's, a, there's always going to be an answer out there for me. I will meet someone who will take me by the hand and say, okay, Joanna, go down here. Yeah. So yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of trust and gratitude. I think so. Where can people find you on social media and online? I'm definitely on Instagram and uh, my website is officialjoanacassidy.com. Oh, oh, we forgot to talk about Mulholland Distillery. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was gonna, how, is, how is that still going? It's going great. All right. And we're picking up again. We're going to be in 10 states and, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, the partners in there are Walton Goggins and Matthew Alper and, you know, listen, covid Took a whack at everybody. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're picking it up again. Awesome. These are the strange little things I'll find. That was that was totally bershirt. Right. You, you know, didn't even like gin. I hated <laughs> gin. I hated gin. And I and I taste the gin and I go, wow, this is this is gonna be a winner. It was like the lip chips, the potato chips. This guy had this little greasy bag of things in here. And I said, let me try those. And I knew it would be a winner. It didn't happen when I was involved, but <laughs> but it was a winner. Yeah. Anyway, our gin, you know, it's gin, vodka, uh, whiskey. It's going to be fine. All, all the, the spirits. spirits. All those good spirits. Um, it's it's going to be fine. That's good. We all want to be in good spirits. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> or have them in us. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's a, that's a good We all want to be in good spirits. I like that. I like that. Well, I encourage people to check that out. I also check check out the pension, um, the insurance, which is, say that website again. It's a, Well, uh, you can go to membershipfirst.com. Uh, you can go to healthcare.org. So there you go. There you, you go. You can go there. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll check all those out. We'll put great. all that up. And um, it's so been great having you here. I want to just say to our audience, uh, don't forget to share the love. You can like, follow, and share on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Search for Money You Should Ask, all one word. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player or visit Apple Podcasts and search for Money You Should Ask or click on the link in the description. If you're watching this episode on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. For more tips, tools, and how to learn how to have a healthy relationship with money, visit themoneynerve.com. That's nerve, not nerd, although often I'm a nerd. Um, Joanna, thank you so much. It's been so much fun, and I thank always you. love catching up. Great. Me too. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>